talked about is the solutions to Maxwell's equations in free space, for which we said there exists a magnetic wave solutions. Uh, but we haven't talked about where those waves come from. We haven't talked about uh, radiation of electromagnetic waves by prescribed sources. So when we talk about statics, quasi-statics, we spend a lot of time saying here we're getting charge distribution, here's a concurrent distribution, here is the field associated with that. But we haven't solved Maxwell's equations as, uh, for the fields associated with time-dependent sources beyond quasi-statics. Okay. So that's what we want to talk about. We're going to talk about the next few lectures. So to do that, let's think about Firstly, let's just first think about the wave equation. Let's just for the moment think about it for a scalar field. Let's forget about the vector nature of the wave for the moment uh, with the source. So we have wave equation with some wave propagation speed c would be the speed of light equals now some source. And we have looked at the homogeneous solution where this was zero, but now we want to look for the particular solution. the source into delta, fun delta functions. So in this case, our delta function uh, is a delta function in space and time. So at time t prime and at position x prime, the source goes boop, and then a wave gets emitted. Okay? And there we say that the source itself is can be thought of as a superposition of those <laughs> weighted by different levels of boopiness. Okay? So um, what is the solution? If I have uh, wave propagation, all of a sudden, I won't say it again, but you get it. What's going to happen when you have this impulse? It's like dropping a pebble 
into a pond. Right at that point, right at that instant, you will get emission we expect from a, an impulse response. In this case, you give us a spherical wave. So what we would expect is right if the source just goes off right then, then emitted from that point is a spherical wave into the would be a circular wave where it's going to be. So that's what we expect to see, and we're going to see that, that that is the Green's function. And then if we had a arbitrary source, which is a superposition of impulses at different positions and different times, then our general solution will just be the convolution of the weighted strength of the source with the Green's function associated with the impulse response, the spherical wave. So we seek the solution So the wave equation with that source. That's the Green's function. Okay? And we can just change variables. We'll call this capital X and this tau. And then the derivatives can be shifted. So this is now the derivative with respect to capital X. D squared by D tau squared. G X tau equals OK. So how do we solve for the grades function? How are we going to do that 
to integrate this by extending into the complex omega plane and then use the theory of residues to determine the value of that integral, particularly the integral of omega. Okay, so let's write this in. Let's write this in. Integral of the omega. So, what we discussed uh, here is that this function is equal to, uh, well, let me say it's like a little way. The integral over omega of dk of omega the tau is equal to the integral of the closed contour in the complex plane in the upper half plane when tau is greater than zero, and in the lower half plane, oh, it's got to be this, when tau is greater than sources, then what we expect is that this Green's function is causal, if that's what we're interested in. We want to know what is the wave that we see at some time due to what the sources were doing at an, at an earlier time. They can't depend on what the sources were doing in the future. But remember, of course, that this integral over here is related to 2 pi i times the sum of the residues in upper half plane of the complex omega plane. And this is minus 2 pi i times the residues in the lower And the residues are related to the poles. So what we discussed when we were talking about linear response theory is that a, a causal response will have its poles in the lower half of the complex omega plane. But where are the poles of this function? are on the real omega axis. Causality 
is not in the wave equation itself. In fact, it's completely ambiguous. These poles are not in the upper half plane or in the lower half plane. They're right on the, on the border between those two situations, which means that there is a causal solution and an a-causal solution to the problem. We can move the poles slightly off the plane by some amount epsilon, in which case we would get the a-causal solution, or move them slightly off with negative omega in, along the imaginary omega axis, and then take the limit as epsilon goes to zero. But these two different limits give us two different Green's functions. We call them, there's a two, there are two different Green's functions, uh, which we are traditionally called G plus and G minus, uh, which I will write in the Fourier domain would be equal to so what I'm doing is I'm moving the poles giving them some imaginary part that uh, I then take the limit as epsilon goes to zero. If I have a negative imaginary part of my pole, it's called the retarded Green function, retardation. And with the other sign, it's called the advanced Green's function. Now, you might say this advanced Green's function is not physical. So why the heck am I, are we even bothering with it? Well, indeed, it's, it, but it depends on the context. Both of these you may be familiar with. Maybe you've seen it if you, depending on what you studied in your advanced quantum mechanics course 522 appear in scattering theory. In scattering theory, one typically is thinking about a situation where what is what we have is some incoming wave and some outgoing waves and we have some scatterer in the middle having to do with asymptotic boundary conditions. And if I'm wanting to say I know in the past the wave was something and it's coming in, then really that problem is kind of a time reverse problem. It's really the advanced Green's function that tells me how that would have happened. And then, of course, the outgoing wave is related to the retarded Green's function. So they have mathematical meaning, which is appropriate for certain physical contexts, when, depending on the boundary conditions that I'm thinking about. And the wave equation allows me to solve for both kinds of Green's function. Okay. However, here we're interested in a very particular problem. We're interested in the waves created by a prescribed source. So for that problem, uh, so this would be related to the uh, goes to Green's function, the S wave. I'm sorry, the, the um, S matrix is related to uh, some combination in to out, which depends on both the incoming and outgoing waves, the advanced and the retarded. But here, for our case, 
we are interested in the wave radiated by a prescribed source. And that means that we're interested in the causal solution. The retarded human solution. All right. So um, that means that the retarded Green's function. as a function of now in, in position space and time is equal to the limit as epsilon goes to zero of this integral with this So our poles are here, and so we then just write this, uh, this, as minus 2 pi i times the sum of the residues. It's minus because this is a contour with the left-hand rule, otherwise it would have been plus 2 pi i. that is equal to, when I put in the poles and the residues, and then take that limit as epsilon goes to zero. Well, I guess I think I might do the ik dot x. Sorry. I get So that, amount, that comes from the two poles, the one at CK and the one at minus CK, which gives us e to the I CK tau, and the minus I CK tau, which is the sign. Okay, so now we just have to do this integral. And um, the way you do it is similar if you go back in time to when we were looking at the Green's function for the Poisson equation. We take the direction x to be the polar axis with which we define polar coordinates for k. Yeah? Um, so the epsilons in there, did you just take the limit? I already did. OK, cool. I already did. I mean, really, in oh, print, uh, I shouldn't have two of these, sorry. Um, um, I mean, really, it's still there. It really gives you a convergence factor, because this integral doesn't really converge. OK. But it converges to a delta function, so I'm not going to bother with it. OK, cool, cool, cool. So.
All right. So um, we turn this into a, we write this in terms of spherical coordinates, v k times k squared, d omega. Do this integral, and we get the following. I wrote the algebra here in the notes. It's boring. And what we get is the causal solution is C over 4 pi delta function magnitude of x minus C tau divided by the magnitude of x. And this is my retarded. And then it falls off like one over that magnitude. 
So the Green's function is, if I now introduce a kind of space-time diagram, and since I can't draw 4D, I can barely draw 3D, and we'll try 3D for a moment. The Green's function, as far as the has this light cone structure. That is to say, the Green's function is non-zero only when CT is equal to the magnitude of X, which in this case is a scripting for just writing this in 2D, it's magnitude of X squared plus Y squared. So this is our outward propagating spherical wave front that comes from, in this case, circular wave front that is being emanated from this point, just like we imagined when we drop the pebbles in the water. Um, what does this solution tell us? Well, what this tells us is that what we see, what wave amplitude exists at position x and time t depends upon what the source was doing at an earlier time. And that time is none other than the time that it took the wave to propagate from its emanating point at a prime to the point of interest, x. So this is the time it takes to propagate. So what this says is the following. Let's think about, this is this kind of space-time diagram where for the moment I'm going to restrict our attention to one spatial dimension and then time. Okay. So here I am, me, at this point, wanting to know something about what wave amplitude I see at this position, at my position at that time. What I see depends upon what was going on in my past. And moreover, it depends on my past that propagates to me at the speed of light. So if these are um, supposed to be lines that have a slope of 1 in these units, this, as you know from your previous studies, is known as the backward light cone. So these are all the light signals that could have gotten to me at my position at my time. So if there is some charge moving around here, then when it crosses my backward light cone, that is a spur that if it emits a wave, that can contribute to what I see right here. So this is uh, the source at position x prime at position t prime. This is its world line representing its trajectory in space and time. When it crosses my backward light cone, it can contribute to the signal that I see. The signal that I see at my time t depends upon what this source was doing at an earlier time if it crossed my backward light cone. If it's in my past, then I would, I could, it could go back to my backward light cone over here. It would contribute to what I see at this time, but it won't contribute to what I see at the present. 
Of course, it also can propagate into my future. <coughs> okay? So, the total signal that I see depends on the superposition of all of the sources doing whatever the heck they're doing, and whenever they cross my backward light cone, according to the retarded time, they can contribute to my signal. And the strength falls off like one over the distance, as a spherical wave must. We study the spherical waves in home. Okay? Now we can see this maybe even a, more explicitly as a spherical wave if we think about this uh, for the case where our source was um, oscillating with a fixed frequency, harmonic frequency. So for a harmonic oscillating source, so let's say that the source as a function of this new time is the real part of some complex amplitude e to the minus i omega t. Okay? So it has some fixed frequency. Um, then the complex uh, amplitude of the wave that I see So again, you know, the wave that I see will be at some complex amplitude. The wave will oscillate at that frequency, at the frequency of the source. So I can now plug this source into this problem. So that says this is equal to the real part of minus 1 over 4 pi, the integral over all space, the source complex amplitude at that space, times e to the minus i, the retarded time. The retarded time is t minus x minus x prime over c divided by Okay, plug in that ansatz for the time dependence of the source into my convolution integral. So this is equal to the real part. So the, the wave amplitude I see is the real part of 4 pi, the integral d cubed x prime. E to the i omit k where k is omega over c. So what we see here is that the complex amplitude of this wave is a superposition of spherical waves. Remember the spherical waves? This is what we derived when we looked at that problem in homework. They propagate out, in this case, centered at x prime, where the wave fronts are on the surfaces of spheres, and the amplitude of the wave falls off as one over the distance from the center of the radiating source. And the strength of that spherical wave depends on the strength of the source at the point of the source. And the, the total amplitude I see is nothing more than a superposition of spherical waves. Isn't that cool? Does that work out real nice? Yes. Yeah. Indeed, they do. Yeah. Now, I don't think Huygens got it from this, but this is the foundational mathematics behind it. Or things didn't have that, so. All right. 
So, um, I just love that. It's come out so nice and pretty. All right, um, let's go to the front board because this as just a mathematics solution, given a weight equation and given uh, then a source, what is the particular solution, what is the Green's function. What we want to now look at is how this helps us find the solutions to math equations with sources. So what we're looking at now is the general solution. match those equations with sources. So let's go back and remind ourselves what we had in status. And now I'm going to return to the microscopic Maxwell's equations. Although we could do the similar thing for the macroscopic equations, which are B's and H's and all that stuff as well. So for statics, we had Gauss's law, the law that shall have no name, Faraday's law. Well. No, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Let's go back. Excuse me. Let's talk about statics. So this is the Faraday's law for statics. Is delta cross E is zero, and Ampere's law. Okay. How did we solve these equations? Suppose there you are, back on your favorite desert island. You got Gilligan and Marianne, but not the professor. And you've got to solve these equations. What are you going to do? Well, the way we did it is the equations that don't involve the sources allowed us to transform the fields into potentials, right? So this equation told us that B itself must be the curl of another vector field that we call the vector potential. And the fact that the curl of the uh, uh, static field was zero told us that the electric field itself was the gradient of another scalar field that we call the scalar potential and by convention of its relation to potential energy, we put the minus sign in there. Okay? And then we plug these back into the equations with the sources. And these two together told us then that the Laplacian of phi was equal to minus four pi rho. And the combination of these two equations together told us that the gradient of the divergence of A minus the Laplacian of A was equal to 4 pi over C J. And then we solve for the potentials. And then once we have the potentials, then we can find the fields by taking the appropriate derivatives. And how do we solve these equations? Well, firstly, we have the gauge choice. We said the divergence of A can be chosen any way we like, because it's completely irrelevant to the physical forces. And for statics, we chose it to be 0. So we ended up with 
in statics, we ended up with these equations for the potentials. And how did we solve it? With the Green's function, right? So we had the Green's function for the Poisson equation. found that some months ago now, and that was equal to minus 1 over 4 pi x over x pi, or magnitude of x minus x pi. And so the solution that we have in this case statics is equal to the Green's function involved with the source, which is equal to the solution we could have written down by heart, Q over R is the potential. And similarly, when you do that convolution for this choice of gauge, we have that solution for the potential. So that's the formal solution to Maxwell's equations in statics. And this is just another statement of Coulomb's law and the Biot-Savart law written in terms of potential. All right, hint, how do we solve this now for the general Maxwell's equations when we now include dynamics? So now let's look at the general case. How are we going to solve these equations? We're going to do it exactly the same way. We have we express the fields in terms of the potentials. We plug those expressions back into the uh, equations that involve the sources, and then we'll use the appropriate Green's function to solve for the potentials. And once we have the potentials, we can get the fields. So as before. Even once we go to the dynamic case, D, it's still related to the curl of a vector field because its divergence is zero. So that's still true. And we still have the divergence of A is arbitrary and can be fixed any way we like according to a gauge choice. All right. However, Del cross E ain't zero no more. So that means that E is not just the gradient of a scalar field, unless this happens to be zero. However, if we look at this equation, then 
I, if I substitute in B as the curl of A, and change the order in which I differentiate, then what we see here is that the curl of the combination of E I, I plugged in here B is del cross A. So there's only one cross. And then there's that one derivative. So uh, this indeed is correct. So what that tells me is that this combination itself is irrotational. It has a curl of zero. And thus, that combination together can be written as the gradient of a scalar, which by tradition is minus 5. And so we have, in dynamics, a slightly and, in fact, very important distinction. The vector potential, as we will see, plays a much more central role in dynamics. And E and B are both related to the vector potential. In this case, now we have this relation. So we have, again, um, potentials. However, we have to think about this business about gauge. So what we said here. Uh, gauge invariance if I make a transformation by adding to A the gradient of some other scalar field lambda which is called the gauge field then because B is the curl of A and the curl of a gradient is always zero, the magnetic field does not change. So one can fix the divergence of A by an appropriate choice of the divergence of this or the Laplacian of this field satisfying an appropriate uh, Laplace or Poisson type equation. What about the electric field? Well, if we're going to change A in this way, E wouldn't stay the same. Unless I also change the scalar field. So I have to, uh, the gauge transformations now involve some transformation of phi going to some new phi prime. In fact, we can see how what phi prime must be because if E, is equal to minus, or goes to minus the gradient of phi prime by dt a plus the grad of lambda under a gauge transformation. If a changes by that amount, and phi is some new phi, well, this then is equal to plus 1 over C D lambda DT plus 1 over C. So in order for E to go back to itself, which it must, because the physical forces depend on E and B, and a gauge transformation cannot change that, then we must have that phi prime equals phi minus 1 over c d lambda dt. So there is a gauge function lambda, which is a function of position and time. And if I shift a and phi, the vector potential and the scalar potential, in this way, 
then I don't change the physical forces. And I can choose those in the way I like. Now, in dynamic, I mean in statics, although it's been erased, we said that the standard choice was to choose del dot A is equal to zero. In dynamics, there are kind of two standard choices. Del cross B 
is equal to del cross del cross a, which everyone knows is the gradient of the divergence of a minus the Laplacian of a, and that equals more pi over c j plus one over c d by dt of e, which is minus the gradient of phi minus one over c dt. So uh, what do we get? We get um, We get here then the Laplacian of A minus 1 over C squared by the T squared of A is equal to minus 4 pi over C J plus the gradient of del dot A plus 1 over C phi. All right, so we just took these definitions of the fields in terms of the potentials, and we plugged them back into the source equations and the real equations. Now we have to choose our gauge. Let's start with Lorentz gauge. <laughs> so we choose the Lorentz gauge. And the vector potential 
is the same kind of integral over the current density at the retarded time. And that's it. It looks just like the solution that we wrote down in the static case. But not quite. It has this very important difference in that the potential I see at time efficient x and time t is not related to what the source is instantaneously at that time, but what the source was doing at the retarded time. And similarly for the vector potential. And that's really important. Because as we'll see, that, that seemingly small difference of this one subscript on this allows for electromagnetic radiation, energy that can propagate away to infinity away from the sources. Now, to conclude, I want to just, because I think it's interesting uh, and uh, sometimes useful. What do these solutions look like if I had chosen the Coulomb gauge? We could have done that. There's no, nothing that insists on me choosing Lorentz gauge. I could choose the Coulomb gauge. So let's look at the solutions in the Coulomb gauge. In the, at the end of the day, the physical fields can't depend on the gauge choice, but the potentials look quite different. So, uh, let's see, let's go over here. In the Coulomb gauge, delta A is zero. So that's zero. So we get L squared phi is minus 4 pi rho at x. And what about the vector potential? Now that A is 0 here. So I get del squared minus 1 over c squared e by dt squared of A is equal to minus 4 pi over C, something I'm going to call JT. Where JT is equal to J, and if delta A is 0, then it's minus uh, Current 
which is transverse. In other words, perpendicular to the pavement. If this was a kind of plane wing. And that's true because if I take the divergence of this, they'll have A0 and then this is zero. So that's consistent. This divergence is on both sides. What is the solution to these equations? Well, this equation is kind of weird. Notice there's no d by dt here. This looks like exactly like the static problem. T is just a parameter here. T is no derivative with respect to time one. So the solution we have in the Coulomb gauge, or sometimes known as the transverse gauge, doesn't have the retarded time in it. It has the instantaneous time. This solution does have the retarded time, but in a way that depends on this funky transversity thing. So this says that A is equal to the integral of J transverse T retarded. So what the heck is going on here? Well, it's a little bit weird. It seems like something is superluminal because the field, or at least, I mean the potential at time t depends on what the source was at some other point in space at the same time, even if they are space-like separated points. Well, that's not really true. It's true in terms of what the potentials are, but it's not true in terms of what the fields are. The fields are still causal. They came from the causal, we I mean, still use the causal Maxwell equations. But we've broken it up into a weird way. Notice this is nothing more than the local Coulomb field, why it's called the Coulomb gauge. In other words, if I just had a source that was a charge density at some time t, and I asked you what is the electrostatic potential about that, this is what you plug in, but with that being the source at that time. This division is useful if we want to divide the part of the field that is near field static in nature from the far field radiation nature. We're going to discuss that next time, this notion of the near field and the far field, the static and the radiation. But in some sense, as far as the electric field is concerned, the electric field, which we said was related always to the scalar effect potentials this way, this part which is the gradient of phi, is kind of the electrostatic part. And this part is the radiation part in the Coulomb gauge, which is why we like the Coulomb gauge. Because then we only have to deal with the vector potentials. And when you do quantum electrodynamics, if you do that, QED, then we always just deal with the vector potential, because that's the part that has to do with the photon. Whereas the scalar potential that that's just some that's something kind of weird and different. Alright. Okay, so just to summarize, what we're actually into to, it doesn't matter which gauge you use, at the end of the day, they'll be the same thing. It's sometimes easier to work with the Lorentz gauge, and that's what we'll do. So we have the formal solution. And you remember what we did in the static case. Once we had a solution, we looked for multipole. And so we're going to now look at multipole radiation, electric dipole radiation, magnetic dipole radiation. All right?